So yeah, preparing for a spacewalk, it's really understanding not just how things are supposed to work, but how they might break. And invariably, things do break. And in fact, one of my mentors, Story Musgrave, said the only thing expected about EVA, which basically stands for extravehicular activity or spacewalking, the only thing expected about EVA is the unexpected. So really understanding how things might break and then having a kind of a hip pocket procedure for what you might do if, if they in inevitably do go wrong. What do you mean by a hip pocket procedure? Well, you know, just kind of thinking about uh, um, what you might do if uh, plan A, B, or C didn't work. You've got to have a, just a, a notion of what plan D might look like. So if you really understand how things, uh, you know, an example that I talk about in my book, but understanding the, the inner workings of the Hubble Space Telescope, it's not just the, elect the, the photons from the stars that get gathered in the mirror, but it's the electrons and the, the ones and zeros of the data and the cooling systems of the, of the telescope. Um, understanding how that is all assembled, and then if uh, you know, part A breaks and then part B breaks, how you, you might have a, yeah. a fighting chance to, uh, to fix it. So you dedicated your book to a very special mission that you were very actively part of, STS-120. Right. Can you explain, first of all, why was the mission so special, and what was your role, and why did you dedicate the book to it? Well, I was the lead spacewalker on this really extraordinary mission to the International Space Station. It was a very complex mission even before we launched. It was a, to install a new interconnecting node to the space station called Harmony that would allow European and Japanese modules to plug in. But then we're also going to be relocating a large solar array truss from the top of the space station and putting it out at the very end. And all this was really kind of sketchy because this solar panel platform had been up there for eight years already. We didn't know if we could even unbolt the thing and uh, allow us to, uh, to relocate it and unfurl these solar panels again. Um, so it started out even before the flight as a really challenging mission, but when we got up into space uh, and we had relocated the solar truss, uh, the panel actually began to rip apart. And you might think, well, what's the, what's the big deal? Well, it was a limp noodle out there, and if we were to undock the space shuttle at that point, we might actually damage the space shuttle or space station. We could have a really horrible situation on our hands. So people worked around the clock for 72 hours. It was a really um, Apollo 13 type moment when people had to figure out what we could do with the supplies we had on board the space shuttle space station complex. You know, we couldn't go down to Home Depot and get a solar array repair kit. We had to you know, build it with the things we had on board. And it was just brilliant. And uh, we had to accept a higher level of risk than we ordinarily would. Um, you know, we're never, we never want to get anywhere near a live solar panel up in space. It's still generating current, even in, in orbital night. Oh, no. yeah, here, here's <laughs> the terror of the solar panel that we had to go out and fix. And it was at the very tip of the space station, further than we'd ever ventured before from the safety of our airlock. And so we had to invent all these new tools and procedures and robotic trajectories. And everyone in, in the entire NASA team was performing at their absolute uh, most brilliant perfection. And, uh, and so I never thought that uh, the team got the, the credit that they were due. And I really wanted to celebrate their, their efforts. So that's why I dedicated the book to them. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you grew up with very adventurous parents, OK, from yeah. moving from one place to the other. Uh, your dad even worked for Boeing, and you lived in Seattle for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so how did your upbringing influence your ambition to work for NASA? Well, you know, being uh, at basically on the front, front row of uh, the space program as a little kid, I saw Apollo 9 from the beach uh, in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Um, my dad was a, you know, a rocket scientist who was in, engaged in the program. And in fact, in those days, you know, time would actually stop. They would actually wheel a, a big tube TV into the classroom and, and everybody, all the students in the class would watch the, the launches. And so um, it was every kid in my generation wanted to be an astronaut when we, when we grew up. And I just kind of never grew out of it, I suppose. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, my parents were very adventurous. We lived uh, overseas for quite a bit of my upbringing. I spent some time in West Africa and in the Middle East and graduated from high school in Athens, Greece. So I really gained an appreciation of people, first and foremost. It's, it's the people that you meet, the opportunities that you take, um, not just the kind of formal classroom education that you receive that really shapes who you are and, and gives you your, your greatest uh, insights in life, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you were John Glenn's personal physician in space. Uh -huh. um, so that must have been like a dream come true. 
Can you explain why it was so special and what are your like, special moments with John Glenn on this space? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I'm sure everyone has heard the name John Glenn. He was our very first American to orbit the Earth. He was in a Mercury astronaut. And in, uh, uh, I guess, February of uh, 1962, he uh, um, orbited the Earth for the very first time. It was a very harrowing mission. He narrowly survived the mission, actually. It's a, quite, a, quite a story worth investigating if you haven't read about him. But uh, for me, uh, when he came back to fly in space at age 77, I mean, it, it was a dream come true. It, it's like getting to play basketball with you know, Michael Jordan, Jordan or uh, um, you know, soccer with Pele or doing astrophysics with Albert Einstein. To get a chance to be in the game with the, the greatest hero of all in, um, in space flight. So it was really uh, um, a wonderful life experience to get to know him personally, not just as a, um, a colleague, but uh, as a great friend. And um, unfortunately, we, we lost him last December. He, he passed at uh, age 95, but he was incredibly, you know, with it, sharp as attack until age, age 95. Yeah, what a wonderful age. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So you applied your medical knowledge during your NASA career, and you're a big advocate for like, innovation. Mm -hmm. um, what innovative concepts did you work on? Well, so um, I, I, everything that uh, is done in an extreme environment has to be rethought. You, um, you know, life and, and science and engineering just behave differently in the weightlessness of space or in other extreme environments underneath our oceans or uh, uh, up on high mountains. And so I, I love going to these extreme environments and using them as sort of a catalyst for innovation. But um, perhaps the the area where I'm most proud of being an innovator is in the aftermath of the Space Shuttle Columbia tragedy. You may recall we lost a, just an amazingly wonderful crew uh, on STS-107. They had performed this flawless 16-day flight, and, uh, and just 16 minutes before landing, tragically, they, uh, they perished because there had been a, a breach in, in the wing of, of their space shuttle. And um, I, could, I could talk a whole hour on, on all that. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but we had to figure out a way to make it safe again. And so it was really galvanizing for the whole NASA team to figure out, first off, what had happened, and then, by God, never let it happen again. And my role after the Space Shuttle Columbia accident was as the lead spacewalker, figuring out a way to go out on spacewalks and repair a space shuttle where it was never meant to be visited. You know, we, we call it spacewalking, but really it's space crawling. That doesn't sound very cool, though. Space crawling, you know, um, you know, out in the weightlessness of space, you're floating. And so we actually use our handrails to kind of crawl around, or we have robotic arms that will take us into different positions. But there's never any intent to visit the bottom of the space shuttle or the wing of the space shuttle because, you know, why would you ever want to go out there? Well, we, we needed to get there, so we had to invent new tools and techniques and materials uh, to, to basically patch up damaged tiles should a, a another accident happened again. And so it's probably my most uh, creative period of life because every day we're working on new procedures, developing new materials uh, and new tools to do that work. Yeah, and besides all those amazing missions, you've also uh, climbed the craziest mountains. So you're the only person <laughs> on the planet who's ever stand on, stood on the tallest mountain of the world and has been in space. Uh, I believe you climbed all the 14ers in Colorado. Is it 58 or 59? 59. 59, 59 yeah. fortuners. You conquered, <laughs> you conquered Aconcagua, Mount Everest, dove in the world's highest lake. Um, so what's left to explore? What's next? You know, my bucket list has never been fuller. You know, and people ask me this question sometimes, and yeah. I find it kind of curious because you know, the, the world is so vast, and there's so many different places to go visit. And it doesn't have to be an extreme environment to be fascinating in, in it. You know, there are places that we may have visited thousands of times, but we can still learn by going there. And, you know, I'm so excited to be living in this day and age where, where so many different technologies are now available to us. You know, um, big data analytics and new sensor technologies, new materials. Um, this is really uh, a heyday of, of innovation that we live in. Forgetting all the stuff that happens in 1600 Pennsylvania and, and elsewhere, but you know, set politics aside, it's really an exciting time in life, I think. And, um, and so um, I, I guess right now I'm really interested in our oceans. Um, 
a, a friend of mine, his name is uh, Phil Newton. He has a company uh, called Newtco, based in Vancouver, Canada. He builds these brilliant uh, vessels that are submersibles and single-person, one-atmospheric dive suits. Um, so he's a, he's a passionate diver and explorer himself. And he, he says that our planet should have been called ocean because 70% of our planet is covered in water. And um, of course, we live, live on land and we call it Earth, but it really is a, a planet of water. And um, it's a bellwether of what our future uh, may hold. And there's a lot of reason to be concerned. We know more about the surface of Mercury and, and, uh, and Venus and Mars than we do uh, of our ocean bottoms. And so to understand what's happening on our, in our oceans is really fundamental. Maybe you want to tell the public what license you just gained as part of your <laughs> book of licenses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, so I, I just visited uh, some good friends of mine up in Everett, Washington. Uh, there's a wonderful company called OceanGate that uh, builds uh, submersibles. Um, and so they uh, are using these assets to, to explore our oceans. And in fact, uh, this summer they plan to actually visit the Titanic. And so the, it'll be the only privately held uh, submersible in the world that could do that. So. Wow. It's impressive. Uh, okay, so you went up Everest twice? Well, uh, one, <laughs> one time to the top, so. Right, but the first time you had to turn around 24 hours before reaching the summit. Mm -hmm. Does it mean you don't have summit fever? Uh, because you did come back a year later. Right? Yes, I did. Maybe you want to explain what happened. Well, yeah, so I'm really, uh, really proud of the way I handled myself on, on Everest. I, I don't pat myself on the back very often, but, you know, I could have, I could have had summit fever and pressed a really bad hand and uh, proceeded on to the summit or tried to get towards the summit with a ruptured disc in my low back. I was at camp three on my summit push, as you said, 24 hours from uh, the summit when I had excruciating low back pain. I didn't, I didn't know what was wrong with me at the time, but I knew it was something really serious. And I, I tried to ice my back down uh, there at camp. And um, I, I really considered, well, maybe I can cinch my waist harness down really, really tight like a, a weightlifter's belt. And, and maybe I can deal with the pain and I could go for the summit. But I realized that you know, I'm, I'm a dad. I've got two wonderful kids and a, uh, you know, a family and friends back home. Should I risk my own uh, my own life, and then more importantly, could I, in good conscience, uh, you know, risk the summit success of my teammates and maybe even their own lives? They would have tried to save me if something really awful happened up higher. So yeah. I turned around. Uh, but then I was able to return the following year, having had surgery. And uh, you know, I, I would say it's one of the, the most wonderful experiences of my life to actually have that 30 minutes on top of Mount Everest because I think the things that come hardest for us in life, the things that we really have to fight for the most, mean the most to us. Um, you know, I, I, if I had summited that first year, it would have been a wonderful thing, I'm sure, but um, the fact that I, I spent four months on the side of Mount Everest suffering and I finally had that 30 minutes of you know, euphoria on top, that was really a wonderful I can imagine. Experience. Plus, in 2009, you brought moon rocks from Apollo 11 mission. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting story behind that, as you explain in your book. Um, yeah. Can you elaborate on that, maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so uh, two of my boyhood heroes were Sir Edmund Hillary, who's one of the first two to summit Mount Everest in 1953, and Neil Armstrong, who was the very first uh, person to set foot on the moon. And uh, they'd become close friends later in life. They'd actually gone to the North Pole uh, as part of an expedition together. So I really wanted to pay tribute to both of them. Neil, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Ed had already passed um, in 2009 when I was going to the mountain, but Neil was alive. And my goal was to actually call uh, Neil on my satellite phone from the top of the world, but my fingers got really cold. Uh, those <laughs> keys on the satellite phones are really, really tiny, you know, so I couldn't, didn't do that. But uh, I got special clearance from NASA to, uh, to borrow an Apollo 11 moon rock, which is really wonderful. And I, I took this moon rock to the top of the world, and then I brought it back down along with a, a summit rock from, from Mount Everest, and I launched that eventually to the International Space Station, where it now resides in the Tranquility Module. Of course, the rock came from the, the Sea of Tranquility. That's where Apollo 11 landed, so kind of a special kind of circle there. But uh, that had benefit uh, was uh, about six months after the climb, I, I got this message on Facebook uh, from uh, a woman who uh, I guess had been the, the person responsible for me uh, borrowing that moon rock. She had chaired a, a special uh, committee that uh, appropriates lunar materials, typically for scientists. And she 
just thought this was a really strange uh, um, request, but maybe it would be good PR for NASA. So she and the team agreed to uh, allow it. But um, ended up that uh, this beautiful, brilliant scientist became my wife. She's actually seated in the front row here. <laughs> so.